Okay, so welcome to lecture number three out of out of four. So the, um, my plan for today is to spend a, firstly just a little bit of a recap on what we did last week, um, especially on um, exponential approximation. So I, I, I think I've said everything I'm going to say about Gaussian approximation, more or less. So I think I think we spent a lot of time on that. So I think I want to not say anything more on that this week. I want to just recap what we did a little on, on exponential approximation, where we got to with that. <coughs> Bless you. Look at um, you. one particular application of, of exponential approximation to to um, sub to, to geometric sums. So sums of a geometrically distributed number of IID variables. We'll, we'll talk about that in a, in a little bit. One, once I've done once we've talked a little bit about that, that's an excellent point to um, pause a little and address one of the comments or questions or requests from last week, which was to say something about how um, how these techniques can be used in a, in a queuing setting. So I'll say a little bit about about that there. That'll probably, by the time we've done that, that'll take us up to more or less the end of the first half, I, I guess. And then I'll spend, we'll spend the second half um, starting to talk a little bit about Poisson approximation. So there's quite a lot of, of Poisson approximation material, so we'll see roughly my plan is to see if we get to sort of talking about this local approach, um, so kind of do some introductory stuff and, and talking about one particular approach to, to the dependent case in Poisson approximation um, this week, and then talk a lot about size bias couplings um, next week, in, in particular in relation to um, to Poisson approximation. So most of next week will be Poisson approximation using size bias couplings. So that reminds me the one thing that's not related to Gaussian tips that's not related to exponential approximation that I wanted to start with. So we did talk a little bit about size bias couplings last week. Uh, we gave a definition somewhere, not that far. Um, there it is. So we talked about this size, size bias coupling and there was, well, there was, I guess, a little bit of discussion about this. So just to kind of emphasize where we were. So if we're talking about the size, size bias coupling. So we had for a random variable, we called it y. And so, so y star was my my um, size bias version of a random variable y. The definition that's there just tells me that I'm defining this by saying that the expected value of g of my size bias version, uh, size bias random variable for any reasonable function g for which these expectations are defined is just equal to the expected value of y g of y divided by the expected value of y. So if I take um, if I take the function so with if I take the function g of say little y is uh, just an indicator that y is less than or equal to some fixed number x, say then I can then I can use that choice of my function g um, to show that the probability that, y, that my size bias version y star is small or equal to x. So I'm to find an explicit expression for that um, for the for the distribution function of my of my size bias version, which if I just plug that in to the definition, it's going to tell me that that's I'm going to assume y has a density, right, just for the sake of writing, writing down expressions. Just, I guess I don't have to. Ah, oh, well, okay, maybe I don't have to, but let's just write, let's, let's forget that then. Let's just, uh, yeah, that's, yes. So, just the, um, Expected value of y times that indicator just gives me gives me that, and the reason I just wanted to say that was just to kind of point out the difference between 
that and the equilibrium distribution we were talking about for exponential approximation. So we said that the sort of the, the, the coupling that we were using for our exponential approximation results was this equilibrium distribution. I'll go back up in a bit and say something like that. But we had this um, this equilibrium coupling. Uh, which we'll call, I'll, I'll write it down in terms of random variable y again, why not? We wrote that as y with a superscript e. So just as a reminder that e has got nothing to do with the number 2.7 in it. Um, it's not a power, it's just a notation I don't like very much, but, but there you go. It's, it's what's in the papers that, that all this is based on. So I, I feel like I have very little choice but to use this notation at this point. Um, so. So we, so we define that by saying that, again, for all reasonable functions, G for which everything's defined, um, the expected value of G primed of this um, equilibrium version is just one over the expected value of Y times G of one, expected value G of Y minus G of zero. Okay, that was related to the characterization that we had in the exponential case, and I'll well, I'll go. I'll say a little bit more about that just to remind us about that in, in a minute. But in this case, if I want to take, if I take the function um, g of y just to be the it's right way around g of y just to be the minimum of y and say some again some fixed number x then that will tell me that the probability that um, my equilibrium distribution, equilibrium version of y is less than or equal to x is just the integral of the minimum of x divided by. So those two things are very similar but but different um, and in particular it's this equilibrium coupling that's 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 the same as the integrated tail that is perhaps a slightly more familiar way of writing this especially if you've done any any work in in renewal theory that's the thing that we can say is is just equal to um the probability of y is greater than So that's, it's this equilibrium version that, that's the same as the integrated tail. The size bias is, is somewhat similar, but, but not quite the same. Though as, um, as we said last week, there is a, there's a very close relationship between these two things in that, um, if I can, in that one of the things that we said was, I can't, I can't see my own notes, so I don't know whether I Is it still on the screen? Okay. Uh, yes, it is just about, isn't it? So these two things are relatively closely related in that um, the, I, can, I can construct the equilibrium version of Y. I'll just write a quality with a D there to mean it's not the same distribution. So I can construct the equilibrium version of Y, the distribution of that, by taking the um, size bias version of y and multiplying by an independent um, uniform random variable between not and between not and one. So well, you have, just has a, un, a, a uniform random variable, it's uniformly distributed between not and one, and it, which is independent of all else. That's not too hard to prove, um, so we might as, well, we'll as well say that now. The proof we looked at very briefly in the, it's in the survey paper by Nathan Ross, but 
if it's referenced somewhere, it needs to like denote probably in multiple places. But essentially, to to get that. So, so what I want to do is more or less look at the expected value of g primed of this thing for any reasonable function g. I'm going to skip writing details of which functions g we're allowed, we're allowed to think about, but essentially thinking about anything for which these expectations are defined. Right? Anything for which g primed is defined and all these other the expectations that I'm writing down are defined. Um, but if they're not, then, then we don't need to worry, and if they are, then everything I'm writing down is fine. So, so I don't, I don't want to get too caught up in in details. But what I, what I want to do is just use this definition of my equilibrium coupling to show that if I look at look at the expected value of g prime times this uniform times my size bias version, then what I get is is exactly this thing that I expect on the. Um, on the right hand side of this of this, of this equation that defines my equilibrium coupling. So what's the what is what is that? Well, we we can condition on the on the uniform random variable that's independent of everything else that's going on. So we can condition on, on that. Just so that's g prime of let's say little u times y star du. So just conditioning on the on the uniform random variable, then we know how to handle integrals of derivatives. So when I when I do that, I'm going to just end up with g of my um, size bias thing divided by my essentially the yeah divided by that. And then just use exactly the definition of size biasing that we had. And so, so I know how to work out the expected value of a, a function of a size bias random variable. And then all that, the extra y that appears there is actually going to cancel out with everything. And so that just gives me that gives me exactly what I want. Nice. It just gives me exactly gives me gives me exactly what I want. Like I said, there's some you need to just I guess you, when you want to actually write this properly, you want to write down exactly what functions you're thinking about and things like that, which I haven't bothered with, but. Um, It's just more or less a small exercise in playing with the definitions. There was a little bit of, not quite confusion, but some questions that I don't think we answered properly last week, just about how this size biasing and this equilibrium coupling are, are related, and, and in particular, which one gives you the, the integrated tail and things like that. So I think that's, I think that's worth spending a few minutes on. Is that okay? Does anyone have any questions on, on that? Um, or is that? That's, so questions are always welcome in the in the chat as always. And if I don't happen to notice that there, I'm I'm optimistic that one of the organisers will. You you haven't let me down yet, so we're, we're good. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, okay, we were using that equilibrium coupling in a in a setting of, of approximation by an exponential random variable. Um, so just usual notion of an exponential random variable, we'll mostly think about um, exponential random variables with parameter one um, because we'll, we'll just assume that my problem is normalized so that my the random variable I want to approximate has, has mean one um, and that also gets away with me having to remember whether I'm defining random variables, defining exponential random variables in terms of mean or in terms of rate um, because when both of those things are one they're, they're the same and otherwise I'll tie myself in knots and get myself very confused about whether I mean what I'm talking about ex expectations or rates. So um, it makes life easier for me as well, I think. So we saw this characterization that we had of our exponential random variable, the same style of characterization as in our Gaussian case. And we'll see something similar in a Poisson case in about an hour's time. So this is this is one of a of a 
well, it, one of infinitely many such characterizations you could write down for the ex, for an exponential random variable. There are similarly infinitely many for the for the Gaussian case that we talked about. Um, you, you can write down at least two different families involving various Hermy polynomials. It, in the Gaussian case, there's only actually really one of those characterizations, which is the one that we we talked about, the one that we started with, that's proved to be useful in, in applications, at least so far. In in the exponential um, case that there are actually two different characterizations um, which turn out to be useful for different applications and um, so if you do ever go and start reading um, papers on exponential exponential approximation by Stein's method you'll that there's a reasonable chance that you that, that uh, what you're reading will use a slightly different characterization to this one um, but I'm not going to really say much more about that the, the ideas that you use in handling them are very similar and, and the, the two are very closely related, but uh, but they are slightly different. So from that characterization, as we did before, we defined our Stein equation, um, where one side of that Stein equation, I'm going to think about taking the supremum over some class of test functions h, which will give me the distance that I'm that I'm interested in in evaluating between some random variable w. And mean one. So, as always, I'm going to use z for the random variable that we're approximating by. So, for the next, well, certainly for the rest of this hour, um, z is an exponential random variable with mean one. And the other side of that Stein equation is taken from the characterization. Okay, we've, we can ignore the f of not term by just assuming it's zero. But, um, but uh, then what, what's there is the difference between essentially the difference between the two parts of my characterization. So that's, that'll be the way that I'll, I'll transform my problem. And then we use this equilibrium coupling um, to give us a way of writing that down. Again, the definition of that equilibrium coupling being very much motivated by the characterization of my exponential random variable and the related Stein equation. So we defined it in such a way that, um, that I can rephrase my characterization as saying that I have, a, I have an exponential random variable if and only if this equilibrium coupling, this equilibrium transformation doesn't change the random variable that I started with. So that's, that's equivalent to being exponentially distributed. The other thing as always that we needed was some bounds on the solution to this Stein equation. Again, you can, as in the Gaussian case, you can work out um, lots and lots of different bounds depending on exactly what you need for the particular problem that you have at, at hand. You can work out bounds on, on f, on its first derivative, on higher derivatives, depending on exactly how differentiable your, your given test function h is. The only bound that we're going to need for the application that we're thinking about um, will be this bound on the second derivative of f, which is going to assume that um, I can, well, that my h is absolutely continuous. So it'll, this is, again, will be good for, for applications in Wasserstein distance, but not so much applications in Kolmogorov distance. But anyway, that's, again, for the sake of, of ease and to avoid getting into too many technical difficulties that we don't want to get into because we want to get an idea of the essence of Stein's method. Instead, we're going to restrict ourselves to thinking about Wasserstein bands. Right. So, okay, so essentially that's that's the setup. So we, we, know, we know what we're doing. We've got the tools that we need for for um, exponential approximation, because then it was, once, once we've got this equilibrium coupling, that gives me immediately a way to evaluate the, say the Wasserstein distance between some random variable W that I'm interested in, that I think is approximately exponential, and my exponential random variable Z, just in terms of how close W is to the equilibrium transformed version. So uh, again, the proof of that result very much mirrored what we were doing with zero biasing um, in the Gaussian case last week and just stems as a, a straight from the definition um, of, the, uh, of my equilibrium coupling. So my Stein equation gives me a way of writing down this Wasserstein distance. I use my equilibrium coupling to replace the, the expectation of f of w by an expectation of f primed of the equilibrium version of w. So 
and then I can just immediately bound that in terms of the second derivative of f and how close w and its equilibrium transformed version are. So again, like in the zero biasing results, this is this is straightforward to prove, and and but the price that you pay for that is now we actually have to worry about how to construct this well, W and its equilibrium version on the same probability space, I'm going to need some explicit coupling to be able to evaluate that expectation, to be able to put a sensible upper bound on that expectation. And that's the, that's the price that we pay, that's, the, that's where we need to be, we need to be a little bit cleverer in, in our construction, because essentially the, the, the upper bound that we write down there is, is more or less free, straight from the definition, but we do need to know so the, the difficulties in doing some coupling to um, to make that work. And this result does capture the fact that that I'm exponential if and only if my equilibrium coupling leaves me alone. Okay, it's sort of sharp in that sense in that, in that if the W I start with is exponential then well this this um, Wasserstein distance on the left hand side is zero and my and because I'm exponential then my equilibrium coupling doesn't change anything, so I can just immediately write down zero on the right-hand side there as well. So that at least is a sensible result in that in that sense too. Okay, so the, the one application of this that I really want to think about is a setting that I quite like. Um, so it's a setting where I, where I want to approximate essentially a sum of a geometrically distributed number of IID random variables by, a, by an exponential random variable. So what I've got, I'm going to ignore the P at the front there for a minute. What I've got is a sequence of IID non-negative random variables, square integral, integral just to make everything work right. I want, I want second moments of those, but that's, we'll ignore that. We've got a sequence of IID random variables. I'm taking the sum of n of these things, where n now is not a fixed number, it's a, it's a, um, it's a geometric random variable which takes values 1, 2, 3, 4 and so on, um, independent of my sequence of my y's, so, so my, all the random variables I'm writing down there are independent of each other, um, and if we suppose that, that geometric random variable has parameter p, so in other words, it has mean 1 over p, then there is a very well-known classical result of Renyi from the 1950s that says that if I scale this geometric sum by multiplying with p and then let p go to zero, then that's going to look more and more like an exponential random variable. So Renyi's result is a, is a limiting result in the sense that it tells you what the, the limit in distribution is, but as always with these Stein problems, what we'll, what we'll um, what we'll get will be a, an explicit upper bound that will apply for any value of p and for, and for any sequence of these random variables. So we get, we get not just the fact that as p goes to zero, we get an upper bound that happens to go to zero. What we'll get is an explicit upper bound that I can apply for any p that I want. So what, what we want to do, what, what we're going to do is, so based on some work by um, Errol Peckers and Adrian Roland, um, we will derive an explicit upper bound in, in Renyi's theorem that will tell me how close this W, this scaled version of a geometric sum is um, to exponential. Actually, their result is a lot more general than that in, that, in, in, the, in, their, in their paper, in this paper that we'll base this on. So they're, they're thinking about random sums where the number of terms is not necessarily geometric anymore, and they even allow some dependence between these random variables y. Um, so, so Renyi's classical result is about geometric sums of independent things, but the, the work that, that I'm basing this on actually gives us, gives us upper bounds for um, any random sum of, possibly, of a possibly dependent sequence of random variables. I'm just in the interest of time and, and space and things like that, I'm actually, I'm going, I'm going to stick with the assumption that these y's are independent 
So uh, um, if, if you want to see how this works in the case where they're dependent, then, then you have to go and look at this paper. I'm afraid I'm not going to say, my, um, say anything about that, I don't think. But it is relatively interesting, I think, and not too much work to relax the assumption that, that my number of terms is geometrically distributed. So, I'm, so we are going to prove something a bit more general than, than, than uh, Renu's result, but not as general as the result that um, Pecos and Roland um, prove. Just to tell you, tell you what I'm what I'm doing, and, what, and especially what I'm not doing, and what's out there in the literature. If you're if you're interested in finding some more, some more. Okay, so here's the here's the theorem. So that there's a. Let's say I'm I'm after we've talked about this result, I'm going to um, pause for a bit from what's in the notes and tell you a little bit about how um, a Stein's method can be applied for some queuing problems and. There's a reason that I'm doing this first. So, oh, so, so I guess the first thing I should say actually is that this is sort of sensible in that if I take this, um, if I take this random sum where, where my n is a geometric random variable, if I happen to take all of my um, y's to be exponential, so if, if all of my y's were exponentially distributed, then um, each would mean one because I'm assuming that, I've, that my y's have mean one. Then this this random sum that I, this w that I've written down does have exactly an exponential distribution. Okay. So there are um, you can you can check that. I'm not going to prove that. I think I might even have explicitly said that as an exercise further down. It's, um, that's that's my excuse for not for, for getting away with not proving it. Is, is writing it writing it as an exercise instead. And then I feel like I've done my bit. <laughs> but um, so yes, yeah, so if I take a geometric sum of, of exponential random variables, then what I get back is an exponential. So hopefully sensible sorts of upper bounds in this problem will reproduce that in that they will, in that they will tell me that if I take the case where my y's are exponential and where my, my number of terms is geometric, then the upper bound that I get should be zero. Okay, and we'll we'll that, that we will check in just a minute, but that's something to bear in mind that we want to use as a um, essentially a, a check of the sanity of our result in, in some sense. So, okay, here's the somewhat long statement of the theorem, but there we go. So here's my, my random sum. So we're, so as I say, I'm gonna stick with the assumption that my sequence y's are independent um, because that just makes the proof that slightly more reasonable length. Um, we're going, they'll, they'll, they'll be normalized so they've each got mean one, which is fine. That's not doing anything other than just making sure that I end up with an exponential with mean one at the end. But I'm going to relax the assumption that my n is geometric. All I'm going to assume is that n is a, is a positive integer value random variable, independent of all of these, all of these y's, and has mean one over p. Um, so I'm just fixing the mean of that because then I want to normalize this sum by multiplying by p. So firstly, so what I've got ends up with mean one, um, so that I can so I can write down an approximation result where I um, where I, I'm approximating by an exponential with with mean one. Okay. So what are the ingredients of this upper bound? So I know how to define the equilibrium coupling equilibrium version of, of these um, y's. So we'll need to, we'll have some sense those equilibrium couplings appearing in my upper bound. I know that I'm exponential if and only if my equilibrium coupling leaves me alone. So that, those are some facts to remember. We're also going to define a transformation of this um, random, this random variable n that I've got here. So we'll define a new random variable m. Uh, it's this, Easier to see in writing than in speaking over Zoom, depending on the quality of the audio connection, where N's and M's can sound quite similar. But anyway, I'm going to define this random variable M just as essentially a discrete version of the equilibrium coupling of my, of my N that I started with. So that's more or less a, a discrete version of this equilibrium coupling. So again, it's just 
once I give you a, a random variable m, once I give you a distribution of that random variable, sorry, random variable n, once I give you the distribution of that, I can write down the distribution of this random variable m. So it's um, once that, if I give you an n, you can you can there exists some random variable m that's defined like this. These um, if the n that I started with happen to be geometric, if I happen to be geometrically distributed, then the m that I get is also geometrically distributed. It has the same geometric distribution. Um, so, so if you like, if you, don't, if you want to ignore this, this transformation for now, then you can. We're not going to lose very much by assuming that my n was geometric, and then everywhere you see an m, just read an n. So if you want to, if, at a first pass through this theorem, that's not an unreasonable way to read it. It's just ignore this definition and replace all the m's by n's, which you can do as long as n is geometric. And geometric is in some sense the most interesting case. That's, that's Rennie's original result for geometric sums of random variables. Okay, so with that definition, so what have I, what have I got? living here in my upper bound. So I've got some constant that's, so remember we're interested in this thing going to zero as p gets small. So having a multiplying by p is a relatively good thing. And we've got essentially two terms in, in, in the upper bound. We've, we've got a randomly chosen y, chosen according, according to this distribution m. Um, well, sorry, sorry, this is the, yeah, the, 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 the nth term of this sequence. Okay, well, yeah, another way of looking at it. The difference between the, that particular y and this equilibrium version. So if my y's are exponential, then all of their equilibrium transforms are equal to all the things I started with. So for each, for each if, my, if my y's were exponential, which we're not assuming that they are, but if they were, then that term is going to be zero because that equilibrium transform leaves me alone. And then the other thing I've got, so I'm going to need to say something about how close this n is that I started with and the m that I've constructed from it, um, because the other term I've got is the difference between n and m essentially in, in my upper bound. If my n was geometric, then m has the same distribution as the n I started with, so if we're doing what I suggested we might want to do and just ignoring these m's and assume n is geometric, then this, this last term goes away, which is nice. And that's, that lets me check that this upper bound really is going to be zero in the case where my y's are exponential and my, my n is geometric, where what I really will end up with is a, is a geometric sum. This is, sorry, it's an exponential random variable. So if, if I've got a, a geometric sum of exponentials, we said that my um, the w that I end up with will also be exponential, and that upper bound will also be zero. And if I want to get away the problem of handling that difference, I can bound that just by this thing. And that's just a, essentially a triangle inequality bound that I'll, I'll show you in a minute, but that's, that's nothing clever. Just, just lets you get away from having to couple the y's and their equilibrium transforms if you want to. Just, it's not a particularly clever bound. So the interesting stuff's going on in, in the first in the first bound there. Okay. So I'm going to show you most of the proof. Um, I've I've left some of the, I've left some of the slightly more fiddly formulas and the as a as an exercise. But um, I guess the first thing that we're going to want to do when when I prove this is um, so so what we're going to use is this general result that we had up here that, that relies on having um, relies on coupling my random variable w, in this case my scale geometric sum that I started with, and its equilibrium version. So to do so, I'm, so I'm going to need to explicitly construct the equilibrium version of this this scale random sum that I started with. So to do that is not terrible once you know what the answer is. Though I, it's one of those things that I have no idea how well. You have to play for a while to see what the answer is before you can then see how to get there. But, um, but what I can get 
So I can explicitly write down this, the equilibrium version of this, um, of this um, scale geometric sum. Oops, I didn't actually mean to do that. <laughs> so we've got the same constant P out of the front, the scaling in the front doesn't change. And we've still got a sum of things to do with Y's, but now instead of instead of having n of these of these y's that i'm adding up i've got first of all m minus one of them so that's my that's my m that's my transformed version of the the n that i started with and then i've i'm also adding on the equilibrium version of an, of an extra one of these the nth of this of this term but the nth of, nth of this sequence of um, of independent things so the construction is not terrible. The, the, the result there is not awful, right? This is not a, an awful random variable to write down. I have to worry a little bit about how I'm getting there. And how you get there, I've left as an, as an more or less an exercise in string together a few, a few inequalities. So, uh, yeah. So if, if I, Essentially, stringing together first this thing and then this thing, because more or less what I've got on the um, right hand side here is very is very much related to what's on the left hand side here. Let's me check that that using the definition of my equilibrium coupling, this really does have that that equilibrium distribution. Um, I can do that by. So more or less applying the definition of my equilibrium coupling to, to each of my um, to, to my random variables y. So I can get this first equation by using the definition using my equilibrium coupling not for the not for the sum not for the w but for, but for individually for some of my y's so my random variables y. And then the second this second um, equality I'm I'm using the um, the definition of this random variable m in terms of the n that i started with so this there's, there's definitely some work to do i mean i i've sat down and checked this at some point myself and it took me a side of a4 to and a couple of false starts where i wrote down some nonsense at some point but um but it's not too terrible once you once you use the definitions in the right way so 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 I've got my, um, once I have this equilibrium version of my scale, gym, as my scale random sum, then what, I'm going to, then what I'm going to want to do is use the bound that tells me what I need to do is look at the difference between twice the expected value of the absolute value of the difference between the W I started with and my equilibrium version. Well, what's the difference? What's the... Um, What's the difference? So there's a constant p that's coming out of both of them, so that's not going to do anything very exciting. There's, there's a two from my result. The expected value of the difference between, well, we're going to have the difference between this equilibrium version of one of my y's and the nth term of this, um, this same sequence. And I'm changing the number of summands here from, um, from an expert. Before I had n terms that I'm adding up, now I've got m terms that I'm adding up. So I'm just going to have some difference in the, well, some difference in, in that, you know, I'm adding up a different number of y's. So I've got some y's that, that, I'm, that are going to be left over when I take the difference between this thing and the w that I started with. Then we'll just split that into two terms using a triangle inequality. That difference there gives me exactly what I want. And um, for the first term, that, dif that difference there, um, since my y's all have um, mean one, we scaled everything so they have, have mean one, then, then that essentially boils down to saying how far apart n and m are. And then if I want to, say if I want to get away without having to explicitly construct the equilibrium version of these y's, then I can do the obviously bad thing it's just going to be bad if these y's are close to exponential and um, because in that case this is going to be very much close to zero but obviously bad but but you know, not necessarily the most awful thing you could do and um, 
of just using the triangle inequality to bound that by the, the difference between, oh, sorry, sorry, the sum of the two expectations. Um, I can work out what that expected value is just using, using the definition of my equilibrium coupling. And just take the, the, the right function g here, it's going to be um, essentially g, g, of, g of x is x squared, more or less. Um, perhaps, perhaps with some constants or some normalization, some sort in there as well, but essentially a quadratic function in that definition will let me work out that, um, will, will, will give me that, it'll give me the um, expectation of my equilibrium version in terms of my original y's that I started with. And all of my y's have mean, mean one, so. That's just one. So then any comments or questions on that would be welcome. I think I've already, there's a couple of remarks at the end, but I think I've already more or less said all of that. Um, in the, so we said that this M is a discrete version of, a, of an equilibrium coupling. We said that if we're geometric, that transformation leaves us alone. Um, there's a reference there, if, you're in, if, you, if you do want to see more about geometric approximation, then there's a reference there. There's also um, a whole section later on. And um, let me skip. The, uh, it's going to be about. So there's a whole bit later on, which I would do if we had more time and may still do if, we're, if and when we get more time, hopefully. Um, but thinking about well, more of this sort of material related to geometric sums, but this time think, thinking not about approximating a geometric sum by an exponential, but approximating other random variables by geometric sums, um, because it turns out that in lots of cases, what we, what we get, and I'll talk about one of those in, in a minute, what I get is, in, in applications, it's exactly a geometric sum, um, and so, in, and so, for, for certain models, what I end up with at the end of the, at the, end of the day is, is exactly a geometric sum. So you might be interested in, in approximating that by an exponential, but you also might want to say, well, what happens if I change my model slightly so that what I get isn't exactly a geometric sum, but what I get is, um, is somehow should be close to a geometric sum. Um, and in that case, you might want to approximate by a geometric sum and possibly then make this a sort of two-stage thing and then approximate that geometric sum by an exponential to give yourself something easier to work with. Um, but certainly there are applications where you might want to think of approximating some random variable that you're interested in by a geometric sum. One of the advantages of that, rather than going to exponential approximation directly, um, would be that, that I can make these geometric sums discrete, and so in discrete, in discrete problems, um, it's perhaps more natural to approximate a discrete random variable by a discrete random variable. There's some, so, so anyway, if you're, if you're interested in more of these sort of geometric sum settings, places where they arrive, how you might approximate by a geometric sum, then there's, then there's a reasonable amount of material here, um, which I can talk about at length because I think when I say, when I reference those three papers, they're all mine, so, um, so I can, I can waffle on about this for as, essentially as, as long as anyone wants me to, um, but I'm going to say I'm I'm not going to say anything now unless people really want me to say something because say this was intended for for later on and we may we may get around to that later on. But anyway, if you're interested in geometric sums, then you might want to read read that um, later on. So any comments or questions before I spend ten minutes or so telling you about some applications to queuing theory? In that case, I will. So I will. So, so there's there's not much discussion of queuing theory in these notes. In fact, there might not be any. I can't remember. There might be one example later on. Um, but so there was someone, and I've completely forgotten who. I'm sorry. But there was someone who was interested in applications of the of this sort of idea, these sort of ideas to queuing theory last week. So let me just show you three papers either at the end of today's lecture or possibly at the end of next week's lecture, um, I will send you the references for these papers. I, I think I promised you references for things I talked about last week as well, and I never sent them. So I should bundle all those up into, a, into one email and, and well, I can, I, I think I can, if I reply to Marina's email, that will get everyone. 
um, and probably is is more sensible than having to go through the um, through the organisers. I, I think there's no need for for that unless the organisers want to control what I'm saying to everyone. <laughs> but um, but I will I will I think just email everyone directly is probably easiest. And, and, and unless anyone objects to that, in which case that's fine, and I'm sure the organisers will be happy to help. But, um, but anyway, so let me. I, I want to show you show you three three papers, and um, I've picked the archive versions of these rather than the published versions because then I know that everyone can get them. Depending at the moment, even if you uh, even if you can't get, get journal versions, so I'm I'm going to not talk about these chronologically. So actually, in terms of the order in which they were published, it's the middle one that came first. But the um, the first thing I want to talk about actually follows on very nicely from what we've just said. So there's some work by um, Robert Gaunt and Neil Walton, both in, in Manchester, um, who look at, so let's, they, they look mostly at the MG1Q, though they also think a little bit about, about the GG1Q. So for those of you who, who perhaps, uh, apologies if I'm, I'm telling you, if I'm telling you something that everyone already knows, but it's, so at the MG1 queuing system, so we have a, a single server, Jobs are arriving um, in, in the MG1 example according to a, um, in, in a Markovian way, that's what the M, the M stands for Markovian. And so arrival times between jobs are independent exponential random variables. Each of these jobs arrives with an with a amount of work that needs doing. Uh, those amounts of work for each job are independent, but they can have any distribution that you like, more or less. And um, that's what the, the G there standing for general. If, if a, when a job turns up, um, if the server is free, so there's a single, just one server here, if the server is free, then um, the server begins work on that job right away. If the server is not free, then the, so the server's already busy working on a different job, then, then the arriving jobs form a queue um, and will wait their turn to, to, be, um, um, to be served. Exactly what wait their turn means doesn't matter too much right now. Um, think of sort of first come first serve where you just join the back of the queue and everything. Um, and, and um, you, you wait until everyone in front of you is finished. You, do, you don't necessarily have to do that. There are lots of other ways that you can think about waiting for your turn, but, but for the sake of this 10 minute discussion, just let's assume first come first served, then um, why not? So the, so the, the thing that um, in this paper that they're, in, that they're interested in Um, in approximating, so the notation in this paper is relatively similar to, my, to, our, to the lecture notes we've been using, which is nice. Um, I, th I think partly because these authors are also in the UK, and so somehow this, there is some kind of, I don't know, I think that helps somehow with notation. Um, I think different nationalities have some different preferences, sort of inbuilt culturally somehow with notation, and depending on what you've grown up reading and what what universities you went to and which textbooks your lecturers preferred and things like that. But anyway, um, Neil and Robert both, both use similar notation to the lecture notes we're working through, which helps. So the random variable W that they're, that they're interested in approximating is, a, is the waiting time of a, of a job or some work that, that arrives. So, so typically that, um, that job will have to wait for a while and um, there'll, there'll be some number of, of um, jobs in the, in the waiting in the queue in front of in front of some piece of work that arrives so that job will have to wait for some random amount of time and so th so we're thinking about a stationary setting right so we imagine that we set up this system and let it run for a very long time so that everything sort of settled down into whatever equilibrium it's going to and then it's so it's known that that waiting time is going to look essentially exponential as the load in my queuing system gets larger so what do I mean by load? I mean, um, essentially, how does the arrival rate of work compare to the amount of work that each job is bringing? So if we're waiting a long time between jobs, that reduces the load in the system because, um, because servers have got plenty of time to work on things before any new, any new work arrives. On the other hand, if jobs arrive quickly, that's increasing the load on my server. I can also think about how changing the load by thinking by changing the amount of work that um, 
that um, that a job brings. So if each job brings lots of work, that's that's making my my server work harder. If jobs bring bring not so much work, then my server has a has a somewhat easier time of it. There's less to do. There's less there's less load on the system. So we're defining this load just to be so. Um, lambda here is the um, rate at which jobs are arriving, um, and E of S is the average amount of work each, each arriving job brings for my server. So this is this is what I'm thinking of as, as my load. We're going to want to keep that less than one. So um, so to, so that, well, as long as I don't want my system to be overloaded, I want that to be less than one. Right? That that row being bigger than one means that that on average in each unit time more work is arriving than, than my server is working on, and so. In, in, in a long-term system, you're going to expect that work to build up to infinity. Um, on the other hand, if that load is less than one, and that's telling me per time unit, my server is on average can do more work than it than is than is arriving, um, and so and so the system is going to remain stable as as time gets large. So think of of rows being less than one for the sake of this discussion. Um, but we can think about heavily loaded systems where a row converges to one, so we'll be less than one but tending to one, in which case this um, stationary waiting time of, of, a, of a job converges to, a, to an exponential random variable. And so this paper quantifies that, gives us an explicit upper bound. Um, so they, there's some rescaling, but whatever. There's a, there's a, everything's rescaled so that it has a mean one because it's Z. Again, same notation that we've been using is an exponential random variable with mean one. Um, this gives us an explicit upper bound on how close this rescaled waiting time is to um, to being exponential. Um, so I think this this might be the. Um, let's think about this one first. Actually, in fact, I, I mean, I'm not going to say very much about this result. We're certainly not going to go into details. I'm not going to go through proofs in in detail, but um, but. Anyway, there's an explicit upper bound again in Wasserstein distance. The proof, the proof you can go away and read for yourself because we have all the tools that we need. Because um, in these, let me find the formula just to show you. There we go. So in the MG1 case and in the GG1 case, the um, Waiting time can be exactly written as a as a geometric sum of the kind that we've just been thinking about. Okay, that's a small line. I'll tell you why it's a small line in a minute. Um, but but we've got so this waiting time is a is a geometric um, is, is is exactly a geometric sum. And essentially, what we've got is a is a random walk, and we've got ladder heights. And a lot of heights and random walks are one place where these geometric sums occur, and what we've got is essentially the same thing. Um, the one small difference between the setting we've just been talking about and this formula here is now my geometric random variable is is not positive anymore, but non-negative. So it's, a, it's the support starts from zero, not from one, um, which means we'll, which means that the authors here have to tweak ever so slightly the proof that we've got. But essentially, you can prove that at least one of the upper bounds that they give um, is just is, is exactly what we've just done, exactly the, the bound that we've just given for um, exponential approximation for a random sum, but just tweaked slightly so that um, the, the geometric random variable has a support starting from zero instead of starting from one. Okay, but that's that's the only change. And you can where's the um, so there's, there's a stand, it's the same standard equation that we just had. Again, notation is the same. F is a solution to that. H is our, our test function. Um, there's a solution. There's the, oh, okay. No, notation is not quite the same because they're, so they've increased everything by one derivative because for, for reasons that I'll tell you in a minute. Um, but there, there, F primed is our F. Okay, but there's, there's the same second derivative bound on our, on our F. It's now third derivative bound on their F. Um, but same difference, um, exactly the same results. The, there's our, these the equilibrium coupling. There's the same paper that I just that I referenced you to as well. There's the same definition we've seen already. Just again, we've increased all the derivatives by one because 
for, for reasons I'll point out in a minute. And, and so one one proof of their of their of their result that's just exactly this more or less the same thing that we've just seen, except now we're, we're in a special case where my number of my number of terms in my sum is really is geometric and modified so that um, so that. So my, my, this geometric random variable starts from zero, not from one, so we get some slightly different normalizations and things like that. But essentially, again, there are versions of those two formulas that are left as an exercise in the proof, for, and, and there's exactly the same argument we've just used. Okay. So if you, you, you've, I've, I'm not going to tell you about this proof because I already have, essentially. So that, that argument gets you one upper bound that we can talk about. They also give a second proof, um, and which, which incidentally gives exactly the same upper bound. Um, and what they, this is their second proof. The, the technique they use for a second proof is a sort of another approach to, to, um, to writing down and solving Stein equations and then, and then actually working with them that I'm not really, I wasn't really planning to talk about, but, but here it is anyway. Um, essentially a comparison of generators approach. So I can think about if I have some, some stochastic process, some marker process, um, I can think about writing down the generator of that, of that marker process. And essentially one way, one very, one relatively well-known way since the sort of late 80s, early 90s, and some work due to Andrew Baba of, so it's one, one way of, getting a handle on characterizations and writing down Stein equations and getting probabilistic representations for their solutions is by using this, this generator for the underlying Markov process. That's one, that, that's the reason that they, that these authors in, in this paper look at, um, at one derivative higher than we do in, a, in our, um, in the Stein equations we were using is because that's the natural way to write things down in this generator in interpretation. Um, so that's the reason that they're, they're writing F prime where we're, where we're writing F, um, because that's sort of the natural way to write these things down when you use this, this generator language. So essentially you can use this, um, um, that, that's, if this is the sort of generator of my marker process that gives me this exponential, um, exponential distribution, then, um, then that's just another way of writing down the Stein equation that we had. And one useful technique can be to, to then, then do the very simple thing of taking away a, 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 a zero um, by, also write, by also thinking about this W that I want to approximate, think about that, think about a Markov process that gives me that as its stationary distribution. So think about, think about the underlying Markov process corresponding to that W now that I want to approximate by. So we've already got the Markov process associated with my exponential that I'm, that I'm approximating, that I'm approximating by. Now also think about a, a random, the random variable W that I'm, that I'm approximating. Think about a Markov process, and in particular the generator of the Markov process that, that gives me that random variable. And then take away the, the zero that I get by thinking about the, um, so the corresponding generator applied to that um, applied to that random variable w. So I so say all, all we're doing is 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 adding and subtracting. Well, we, we, we're taking away zero That's because that this this thing by definition is going to be zero because I've got the same random variable there as I have there. But then somehow this gives me some extra um, flexibility, or it's sometimes useful when I when I then want to take Taylor expansions. Because then rather than just looking at, at sort of one generator, I'm somehow comparing two generators which should be very similar. And so somehow this can be massaged into a, a Taylor expansion argument. Um, and it's, it's a relatively useful technique that's used in a few other places as well. So these, these authors use it here for exponential approximation. Um, and it gives, it gives exactly the same bound as they did before. It's also been used in other places. So I'm going to go relatively quickly just for, just for five minutes. Um, so the, the first, and actually I think more sophisticated application than, than, than the, the Gordon Walton paper that we just looked at to, to queuing, to uh, science method queuing theory is in, the, is in the setting of approximation for the, um, 
not for the waiting time now, but for the number of customers in the system, so the, the number of, of jobs that are living in a system in equilibrium, by um, limits of diffusion processes. So, so if you scale these things correctly, then they, then they in the limit, they look like um, equilibrium, equilibrium of diffusion processes. So these, these two authors in particular did, did this for, um, for in, a, in a paper for, uh, for relatively sophisticated queuing systems that I now can't see the reference for, never mind. Um, there. So these sorts of queuing systems, for those of you who know this kind of notation, then, um, then Braverman and I did some very nice work on, on um, for approximation for e e equilibrium um, number equal jobs in the system in, in these in these kind of queuing systems. They've also written what's essentially it's not quite a survey paper, but it's sort of getting close in that it's designed to introduce similar techniques. They were this third author, so it's, it's, it's essentially a simple, a slightly simpler version, some slightly different examples of, of their original work, and the, the work of Braverman and I, which is more sophisticated but also slightly harder to read. So this is why I'm showing you this paper instead. So they they use essentially the same generator approach. So they they um, they write they write down you know, so that. The, a birth death process that tells you about the number of number of jobs in the system at time t we're going to let that go to stationarity and then and we're approximating that by the um, well, what's the normalized version of that by by the um, equilibrium distribution of a, of a uh, diffusion process with a particular generator and then they use this comparison of generators approach to write down um, to write down the, the Stein equation and the um, and actually explicitly formulate some bounds and things. One of the reasons that these that the systems that they think about in this particular I say not quite survey paper but but not the most sophisticated paper that, um, is that in this case the the um, the systems that are thinking about in particular say an, an MMN queue, um, where with n servers, again, in, interarrival times of jobs are exponential, and, and the amount of work that jobs are bringing are exponentially distributed as well. Um, so in that case, the, the Markov chain birth death process that we're thinking about is um, is univariate, single dimensional, um, and that that makes the whole problem a lot easier. In the in their original work for these particular systems, the um, the um, underlying process that you think about has lots of dimensions and then you need and then you need to worry about state space collapse as well um, so if you're familiar with state space collapse things then then you can probably tackle tackle this paper but if you don't like state space collapse then then this is certainly this this paper is a slightly easier entry point into the literature here final thing i want to say say before we stop for a break is there's some very recent work which has not quite been published yet there's on the archive um, of these authors who take essentially the same idea of, of Braverman and I, but now look at process level results. So, um, so one thing that we said before very briefly and not really expanded on is the fact that you can write down, or you can um, apply Stein's method rather for, um, for multivariate things, but also for, for infinite dimensional process level results. Um, so, and, in, in that case, in this paper is taking, I'm trying to see there, um, is taking these kind of these kind of results again, a process which is counting the number of, of jobs in a in, in a queuing system, and showing that, that the process converges um, to in this time at a process level to a to a Brownian motion. So you do have to worry, of course, there about what metric you're using to quantify that that um, that convergence. The um, all of them, all of the kind of metrics that we've talked about have been in our, in our lectures are designed for for um, single random variables. They're designed for the for the uh, univariate case, and quantifying process level convergences requires a bit more. You need to be a bit more delicate about the metrics that you're using, the way that you're quantifying that convergence. But there's this very recent paper that, that does that. So I'll, I'll send you references to those. 
send you links to, to the archive versions of all these. Um, but that was, sorry, that took slightly longer than I intended it to, but um, that brings us probably to a, a, a good time for a break. Should we say 10 minutes and come back for a relatively short second half at 20 past? Yeah, uh, okay. Sound good? 20 past yeah. five, okay. Yep. Yeah. All right. Sounds good. And I'm happy to hear questions in the chat or whatever while, while, we, while we have the break. I'm just going to go and get some more water, but I'll be back in a second. Mm, so Fraser, uh, yep. so we discussed uh, the relationships be between uh, size bias and uh, equilibrium transformations. What about zero bias? Um, so, is, I... so it, it just again like uh, when I saw the, the result with uh, geometric sounds, I just thought, oh, there's this uh, uh, difference between uh, one re uh, one summand and transformation. Oh, we did the same thing with uh, zero bias when we just had uh, independent sounds, but the count was. Uh, yeah, yeah. yeah so same, you get the same kind of thing in, in size biasing as well. Um, so, so when you size biasing a sum, you get essentially to, you pick one size bias that and Leave the rest alone, and if you've got a random number of terms in that sum, then then there's some fiddling around with the with the with that random variable that goes on too. Okay. Yeah. You, 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 yeah. You get sort of very similar results in lots so of different settings. Is it all about just there's this uh, property of of uh, distribution when we want to get, and we just kind of change one small stuff, we scale the other things and we just boom, get result. Is this like the big idea? Yeah, yeah, I think so. I mean, it, okay. it's, it's sort of, it's, it's a bit like the sort of Lindeberg central limit theorem idea where you're sort of replacing, you, you, you take, you write, you're, you're, you write normal as a sum of, sum of normals and you're, and you're um, you know, you've got this independent command and it's a sum of independent things and you're somehow replacing one by another. It's, uh, not, it's some kind of analog of that, but yeah, yeah, I, I, yeah. I, I, I can happily write down proofs for all these different settings, you know, zero biasing, size biasing and, and all this equilibrium coupling as well. Oh, I stuck in, but, but, but I, I don't know of a sort of, I don't know that people have thought about why the same sort of representation holds in all these cases. Mm. I'm, I'm I mean, not sure. We, we try to delve into it. Uh, again, like we're interested in the, this uh, integrated tail with mm. the equilibrium, or is it true for size biased? So yeah, basically we discussed the, exactly this on Tuesday, I believe. So yeah, so we try to understand it. We, we saw that. But again, it's just some interesting tricks are going on and they're kind of mysterious. Yeah, yeah, there's, there's stuff which is relatively close to magic happens at some point. Exactly. It's, yeah, and I don't... And again, it's probability, so... Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's okay. Yeah, I, I don't entirely understand that magic. I, 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 don't, I don't have a good intuition as to why you know, why when you want to zero bias it as some you, you you replace one of its terms by a zero biased version I, I, I don't i don't have a good feel for, for why that's intuitively obviously the right thing to do mm. i mean uh, I, I guess like with equilibrium you can you can sort of see it with uh, exponentials i mean at least with geometric you can see that oh equilibrium is also geometric oh equilibrium yes, or geometric. Yeah. yeah so yeah, at least yeah you can see that oh okay equilibrium the whole point is that you do something to go closer to this. So here you can yeah. see, I don't know, maybe there's similar examples for uh, zero bias, size biased. But again, like uh, the, the equation that equilibrium is uniform multiplied by size biased, that's just even harder for me to digest. 
I guess hopefully we will discuss it on either Friday, yeah. uh, probably not tomorrow, but on Tuesday, hopefully because that's then, then again if we will have time. I don't know. So my my guess is the right way to think about that is probably in a renewal theory setting. Right? You can sort of interpret everything as so all the the sort of usual wait waiting for a bus type example. Right? What's the so the hang on the if you if you look at the the time you is it somehow relating the average time between buses to the amount of time you have to wait if you turn up randomly or something like that? Is it doing something like that? Um, Maybe. It, I, mean, I guess we, we, we just sort of need to. Again, uh, I'll probably, uh, I mean, or oh, somebody, I'll probably try to find this statement in Ross and then maybe see some idea there. Yeah, I, I, I think he, he might. I don't remember him giving some kind of probabilistic interpretation of this, but, mm. um, but well, yeah, so, so seeing it written down a bit more formally than I have, uh, for sure, is, is, is an excellent idea. Okay. <laughs> I guess. Um, okay. Yeah, this is this is a it's a good point actually. Why does the mm. my 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 guess is there's, there's some renewal theory intuition there. Okay. Oh, we'll think about it. But, but mm. oh, I don't know. Maybe that's just because all all these integrated tail stuff. Is, I mean, if, if anywhere I see it, I think of renewal theory because somehow this is why you why you met it first and, and why. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I first. okay, so it's five twenty-two. I guess we can yes, start. Probably, probably start again. You can still see my notes. I think. Mm, yes. Yes. Okay. okay. So, what I want to do for I guess forty minutes or so is just introduce you to a bit of Poisson approximation. So the sort of third setting in which we're <coughs> in which we're talking about standard method. And in some sense, things get a lot easier here because everything's discrete. So the first couple of settings we were thinking about with Gaussian and with exponential approximation, um, the underlying random variables are continuous, and that gave us problems with, with approximation in various in some metrics that we were interested in. Um, but these, these problems just don't, don't arise in, this, in the discrete setting. So in some sense, it would have been easier to start here, but um, I decided to go chronologically and start with Gaussian. Um, for whatever reason. So the sort of canonical setting for Poisson approximation is that I'm interested in approximating a sum of, of um, indicator random variables, so some of Bernoulli random variables, um, which we will in general not assume are independent. Okay. As, as, as always, things get easier if these things are independent. Um, so that's the first example I'll show you. It's like in the Gaussian setting, but, um, but in general, we're, we're aiming at approximation for sums of dependent newly random variables, because that'll let us get a handle on a lot more in the way of applications. Um, so we sort of expect that a reasonable approximation there might be, might be Poisson. Again, I'll use Z for the thing I'm approximating by, so Z will always be a, a Poisson distribution with mean lambda, and nothing, nothing funny going on, supported on 0, 1, 2, 3, and so on. Um, we've mostly so far thought about Wasserstein distance, and we can, I, I could very easily have wanted to, if I wanted to, um, stuck with, Wasserstein distance for this whole Poisson section as well. Um, there's essentially one thing you need to change everywhere you go. I'll tell you what that one thing is in a, in a minute. Um, but it's sort of more usual in this setting to think about total variation distance instead, um, which is, I can, there are lots of different ways of writing down total variation distance and I haven't written, uh, the, the, the most natural way to write this down, which I think is, the, is a way that I haven't written it down. Um, where am I? So it's so this total variation distance between say my random variable w and my plus on z. I look at the probability that say that my random variable w lives in some particular set. Let's call it 
a I look at how far that is from the probability that my z is living in the same subset a and I see how big the absolute value of that difference can be as a varies over all subsets of my non-negative integers that's I think the most natural way to think about total variation distance I'm not quite sure why I didn't write that formula there but I didn't but there's a couple of other completely equivalent ways of, of thinking about it um, that are here and it's relatively strong metric I mean it's it's typically too strong for things which aren't discrete um, but but works very well in, and gives us a sort of strong sense in which things are close for, for discrete random variables um, so it tend, tends to be the thing that people do here I can I can write it like oops like this which gives me a way of of capturing that in my Stein's method framework I can think about this as a supremum of the expectation of h of w minus the expectation of h of z to value that um, over some class of functions h which is the kind of metrics that I need to be able to apply Stein's method this time just thinking about h's which are bounded um, bounded by one for the sake of fixing a constant there but, um, but essentially bounded functions h so I want to, I'll, I'll go relatively quickly, but before I do Stein's method in a Poisson, Poisson case, I just want to show you um, essentially a couple of simpler arguments for Poisson approximation, particularly to, to, so for the independent case. Okay, these arguments work in the independent case, not for dependent things, but will just show us that even in um, the independent setting, there is that you need something a little bit sophisticated than the just some very simple arguments. Um, so let me, and it'll be useful later on as well, let me just give you a couple of, of relatively old Poisson approximation results um, for, for sums of independent Bernoulli random variables that are due to Lacan, I guess, in the 50s. Um, these use the idea of, of maximal coupling. So essentially, so if, if I've got a, a pair of random variables, the, the maximal coupling is the one which gives me the biggest probability of those random variables being equal. And so I, I have a pair of random variables X and Y, I have a whole host of ways that I can choose to construct those on the same probability space. And the maximal coupling is the one which makes these X and Y equal with the largest possible probability. Okay. So that's, that's useful a little bit later on for some Stein stuff that we'll do as well. So and that was a definition just to park in our pockets. And it also gives us um, a way of, these maximal couplings give us a, a, an alternative way of thinking about my total variation distance as if the two formulas I had um, a, a, on, the, on my notes and the one formula I've written down here aren't already enough. Here's a, a fourth formula for total variation distance. I can, so between two random variables, X and Y, my total variation distance, I can think of as a probability that my maximally coupled versions aren't the same and, and I can, I can write that. I, I have an explicit formula for the problem, but they are the same as well, which is sometimes useful. Lots of different ways of thinking about total variation distance. Here's a very simple theorem, which um, just, you just combines those ideas in a relatively natural sort of way. So this is one of Lacan's many, many, many results in this sort of setting. Um, and of course, he did much work in lots of other settings as well. But um, this is one result that happens to be due to Lacan. That says that I've got a sum of independent Bernoulli random variables. So when generally different means call, call the mean of xi pi. And I've got a Poisson random variable, so z will be Poisson. Almost always, possibly everywhere in these notes, I'll fix the mean of my Poisson to be the same as the mean of the thing I'm approximating. Um, so if I, I mean, we've got some parameters, so that seems like a natural way to choose it. Um, that there are other choices you could you could think about as well and, and in some cases other choices are, are also sensible and you can think about how these results change if I allow the mean of my Poisson to be some general mu and not necessarily the same lambda as the mean of my w but for the sake of these lectures what well, I think we're always or at least almost always going to think about the mean of my, my w and the mean of my Poisson to be the, being the same. In that case I can explicitly bound the total variation distance between my sum of independent Bernoulli's and my um, 
Poisson by the sum of the pi squares, okay. which, which is reasonable. And it's going to be smaller if my p's are small. That's the sort of setting you expect to get Poisson convergence. So it looks like a very reasonable sort of upper band. It's not too hard to prove. Um, in that, so I can use the fact that my z, my, my Poisson is infinitely divisible to just write that as a sum of, of a whole bunch of independent Poissons, each, each with mean pi. Um, and then just think about coupling each of my Bernoulli summands with my Poisson summands in a maximal way. So, so just take each term of my, so, so I've got my, my W is a sum of X's, my Z is a sum of Z's. Couple, couple each of those terms, so X1, Z1, X2, Z2, X3, Z3, so we've got N of these couple things that we're going to couple maximally. I can use your formulas above that I didn't prove, but I sort of, I didn't want to because they take us a little bit too, a little bit further away from the main flow of these lectures, and I wanted to, but it gives us a bound on, on the probability that these maximally coupled things are the same, um, and then just use a nice union bound to to talk about coupling of the sum. I mean that's just the, the formula we have for total variation distance in terms of the maximal coupling of the sum, but I can just use a nice union bound to, to give me a map that in terms of maxim maximal couplings of the individual sum ends. Okay. It's, it's not terrible. It's a, it's a very neat argument, it's a very nice argument. The upper bound is, is going to be very reasonable in lots of cases, but certainly there's a lot better we can do. So one of the reasons that we can do, that we know that we can do a lot better is because Lacan himself did. Um, so he proved results like, so he proved things which are, can Im improve that result quite a lot in particular, this second upper bound here, which needs some restriction on the PIs, but, but let's ignore that. What I'm, that's the main point about this is, is the fact that I can get this extra factor of one over lambda um, in, in this bound. And if we're in a setting where lambda is getting large, so think about n, be, n getting large, so n is growing and my PIs are not shrinking fast enough in some sense so that my, my mean lambda is getting large as n gets big then this extra one over lambda can be quite a big improvement over just the sum of my pi squares. So somehow this, this, this scope to improve these results, okay, and, and even, in the, even in the independent case, so that the Stein arguments that we get will get us this extra factor of one over lambda, and we can and I'll, I'll show you a formula in a minute without in any way, but that will sort of tell you that this is the right order of the upper bound as well. So this this um, this sort of one over lambda times the sum of the pi squared in the independent case is in some sense the right answer. So there's some constants that again we don't I'm not I'm not too worried about constants and purposes of these lectures I don't care about constants. Constant eight is clearly very bad. Um, but the um, but the one of the, some of the PI squares over the lambda is, is the right thing to get in the upper bound there. And Stein will, will get us that. These sort of one over lambda type things are sometimes called magic factors, um, because somehow they, they win you a lot. And that, the, when you use Stein, that magic factor is going to come from the fact that, um, it, it's going to come from the bounds that we get on the solution to my Stein equation. That's exactly where that magic factor is going to appear. Okay, so, Let's, having told you about cross time approximation and some other, well, these are some other kind of coupling ideas, let's actually start doing some Stein's method. And there's not an awful lot to say to get stuff set up because we sort of know how these things work. The, the only thing we have to understand, really, the only change is that um, instead of derivatives in my kind of characterizations that I'm going to write down, because derivatives are naturally a continuous thing, and now, now we're discrete. Um, I'm, I'm going to use this dif this differencing operator um, that just so when I apply that to a function g, it just at the point j it just gives me the difference between g of j plus one and g of j. So essentially, something telling me about the the increments of my function g. Okay. So more or less, we're going to try and do the same kinds of things that we did before, but everywhere we saw a derivative, we're going to use a differencing operator instead. But, and, and that works. You can you can argue back and forth about whether this this derivative is a natural sorry this differencing operator is a natural analog of a derivative or not. Um, the the irrefutable 
end to that argument, I think, is, is that it works in this setting, so let's just do it. Okay, so we need a characterization, um, and there it is. So the characterization that we're going to use is that I'm Poisson if and only if um, lambda times the expected value of g of x plus 1 is the same as the expected value of x g of x. So for all reasonable functions g, call them bounded for the sake of argument. Okay, lambda is the mean of my Poisson, so I'm Poisson if and only if that holds. Um, Again, if you want to prove that, proving that if I'm Poisson, then this formula holds is just a case of write down one expectation, play around with, with essentially a recurrence relation for the um, mass function of a Poisson random variable and show that it becomes this thing. Um, to prove the other direction, like in the Gaussian case, the easiest thing to do is to write down the Stein equation, show that it has a bounded solution, and then essentially mimic what we did in the Gaussian case. Um, I'm not going to I'm not going to go into that proof, but it's essentially if you follow the same steps that we did for the Gaussian thing, then um, um, then it works. This also gives you some idea of why size biasing will be useful. We're not really, I'm not, I'm definitely not going to talk about size biasing in a Poisson context today, but that will be pretty much all I'm going to talk about next week, I think. Um, so this sort of expression divided by the mean is exactly how we defined my size biasing. Where did my bit of paper go? That was... We talked about... That's, that's the formula that, that defined my size bias coupling. And so it's, it's from that, you, you combine that definition with this characterization and what's this characterization is saying? It's saying that, that um, I'm Poisson if and only if size biasing is the same as shifting by one. Okay, so sh shifting one one place to the um, to the right is the same as size biasing, if and only if I'm um, I'm Poisson. So there'll be lots of natural natural ways of, of doing of doing Poisson approximation is to compare the size bias version of what I'm interested in with a shifted version of what I'm interested in, and hope that those two things are, are similar. That's the whole idea. There's um, the, um, I mean, we'll, we'll talk about ideas related to that, say, next week. Um, there's a lot more that, that, I, that we could say on this topic than, I've, than I'm going to and that I will have time to do. And if you, if you want to think about Poisson approximation using size biasing, then the, the book by Barbara Holston Janssen uh, from 1992 is a fantastic reference and is a, is a book length treatment of Poisson approximation using size bias couplings. Um, this, Loads of interesting examples. There are there's lots of interesting theory. Um, so it's, it's from 1992, which is a, a while ago, but it's um, it's essentially still in lots of cases represents a state of the art. It's very readable. It's um, it's it's, just, it, it's an excellent book. It's an excellent reference. It's a it's, it's a fantastic starting point for Stein's method for Poisson approximation. Um, so feel free to go and find a copy of that when you have access to a library again. Um, Okay, so then we, I've got my characterization, so I write down my Stein equation. Again, one side of that that's motivated by the characterization that I just had. There's my sort of shifting by one term. There's my size biasing term, um, more or less. And there's the side that I will, so I'll take the absolute value of, the, I'll, I'll replace my j's by a random variable w, I'll take absolute values, I'll so I'll take expectations, so I'll take absolute values, I'll take the supremum over some class of functions h, and then that will give me a way of quantifying how close w and z are in a way that I understand. And again, my, my Stein equation lets, lets me transform that into a statement about um, the random variable w. Um, again, one, one advantage here is that on the um, on the right hand side, I've only got a single random variable. I've only got W. I don't need to worry about um, about my Poisson random variable Z anymore. So if I want to do some coupling, it's it's much easier in general to construct say double size bias version of W and a shifted version of W on the same probability space than it is to construct W and, and a Poisson on the same probability space. And so that's that is still a win, even if even if I want to do some coupling ideas. And say again, the idea is that if if um, 
if w is close to Poisson, this thing should be small, so we'll, we'll bound what's on the left by instead bounding what's on the right. The same metrics we're interested in, we can, we can, I can take those, those functions h to be bounded functions, so which will give me my total variation distance, like we said. I can also take, um, again, h to be um, Lipschitz functions, which will give me a Wasserstein distance. I can do Wasserstein um, approximation in this setting as well. I'm not really going to do that. But the only thing that needs to change if I want to do Wasserstein instead of total variation distance are the bounds that I'm using on this solution f to my Stein equation. So again, once I write down this equation, um, this equation here, I'll need to find bounds on, on, um, on the solution f to that equation that will depend on the function h. The bounds that I have will um, be a little bit different depending on what kinds of functions h I'm thinking about. Um, but, but if I want to transform all the total variation results that I'm going to think about into Wasserstein results, all I have to do is change the bound that I'm using on this function f. So um, I will show, I'll show you what those bounds are. As in every other example, this equation I can just think of as a difference equation, a recurrence relation, however I want to think about it. I, there's, there's essentially no probability there, so if I want to find bounds on f, that doesn't depend on any random variable w that I want to approximate. It, it doesn't depend on doing any probability if you don't want to. Um, you can just think of that as a difference equation and find, the, uh, find a way of writing down the solution and then find a way of bounding that, that solution. Um, so there are bounds that I can get in the case of um, total of h is related to total variation distance and h is related to Wasserstein distance. I get slightly different bounds, um, but I can, I can plug those into expressions that so I'll need those in the same way that we'll need these kind of bounds. We need, we need these bounds in other cases. Um, so this, that one over lambda there in, in my, the bound on the, on the increment and the step size of my f's in the total variation case is, is the thing that's going to get us this magic factor of one over lambda that we talked about for um, independent sums, Poisson, for Poisson approximation for sums of independent Bernoullis. That's that one over lambda that we said was sort of missing in the maximal coupling result. That's where we'll pick it up in the Steins method proof. One annoying feature, so it's very natural to to look at this, look at these results and say, okay, so here's a bound on f, here's a bound on the increments of f. It's sometimes useful to have bounds on, say, the um, on delta squared of f, so the, the the increments of the increments of f. So applying this forward difference operator twice, and you look at these kind of results and and use and use. Um, say well okay we're sort of we've got a one over root square root of lambda essentially for f we've got a one over lambda for the increments of f so if i want to look at delta squared of f then surely i'm going to get a one over lambda to the power three over two or something right i'm going to get lambda to the minus one and a half it's sort of the the, the natural way to extrapolate that result and that's not true um, and it's incredibly annoying when you want to do slightly more intricate process and approximation results than we're going to think about because to get bounds of the right order um, if you just want to sort of go through and use the same kind of arguments that we're doing now then what you want to, then what you want is a is a one over lambda to three over two to appear at some point and it just doesn't because all these delta, delta squared of f and delta cubed of f and whatever delta four and so on they're all bounded by by essentially one over lambda again and that power of lambda doesn't get better and that that causes annoyance if you want to do more delicate Poisson approximation results um, for reasons that I'm not going to go into but just if you do ever want to do do sort of asymptotic expansions sort of further terms of things like that and want to use second differences of f they're not bounded in a way that you might hope they are annoyingly right so let's see how this works in the independent case okay so we'll revisit exactly the same setting as we as we talked about already so this this is an argument due, due to lewis chen who as i say stein's method was first developed by charles stein in the gaussian case in the in the late 60s and then his phd student lewis chen published a paper in the mid 70s in which took the gaussian ideas and applied them in the poisson case so again we've got independent Bernoulli random variables each with mean pi 
um, lambda is just going to be the mean of, of mean of the sum, so the sum of the pi's, and z will be a Poisson with the same mean. Then I can get the total variation distance bound that looks like essentially one over lambda times the sum of the pi squares. So the same, um, the same as in the as in the last of the kind of results that we looked at. But one minus e to the minus lambda is not doing anything, right? I mean, it's, it's not very exciting. It's essentially one, so ignore it. Um, but it's, so we, we get the right order of magnitude as in as in the cams and as in the, the, the sort of last and in some sense best of the cams results that we looked at with with a better constant than the eight and without and there's no restrictions on my p's here. Okay, so the, the last result of the cams that we looked at said that my pi's all had to be less than equal to a quarter or something like that. Um, this has this has no restriction on my, on my p's. So okay, let's. Let's prove this because we can and it's not too hard. So just to make the notation a little bit easier, I'm going to write wi to be the sum of all but the ith of my x's. So just the sum of all of them take away xi. Okay, just to make some, just for some, some notation. So then what am I doing? So this is, that's what was on one side of my Stein equation. So that's, so what I'm gonna to want to do to bound the total variation distance, I'm going to take the absolute value of that. I'm going to take the supremum over, over all h's which are bounded by one. So this is the sort of object I want to bound. So let's just replace lambda by the sum of the pi's. We'll replace w by the sum of the x's. Okay, and pull the sum out of the expectation. And then we'll say, okay, for, for every i, so my xi's of the newly random variables are either zero or they're one. So they're one with probability pi, in which, and if, it's, if my xi is one, then w is just wi plus one, because wi is everything apart from xi, and xi is one. So that's, so with probability pi that xi is one, and w is wi plus one, and with probability one minus pi, xi is zero, so everything there is zero. So just essentially conditioning on, on my xi, that's just going to let me more or less turn that, that, that x there into a p so that I can pull those p's out of the, out of the expectation at the cost of writing a wi plus one instead of w. So now, so I, I want to bound the absolute value of this thing. So let's take absolute values. We'll use the triangle inequality to pull those absolute values in, into the sum. So what I want to bound is lots of absolute values, the terms that look like, look like this. And how can I do that? Well, I've got the difference of f at two, at two points, a w plus one and a wi plus one. So um, what's that? Well, what's the biggest that can be? Well, it's the, it's, the biggest it can be is sort of how far I've gone between wi and, and w times how far I can go, times how, how big the increments of this f are. So f can take steps of at most this size for, for, each, for each step between w and wi. So, so all I need to do is count, is count how many steps I've got, how far have I gone between these two random variables, and how and then the biggest I could, have, I could have moved is this thing times that number of steps. And I know how to bound this, this thing. That's exactly one of these Stein factors. Or they're sometimes called magic factors as well. They get the, that's the thing that wins me my one over lambda. So I take those in the, in the lemma. And what's the, what's the difference between W and WI? Well, they differ by, by XI. And xi has is either zero or one, and it's one with mean pi. It's one with probability pi. Sorry. So that's that's not too bad, and we've got rid of everything to do with my to do with my f's and my h's and things like that now. That they're all everything to do with with f is living inside this one over lambda term. So I've bounded lots of things that look like that. I've got so I've got a pi there. I've got a pi there. So when I pull out the bounds that, when I pull out this one over lambda out of, out of the sum that we had up here, 
I'm going to get a sum of pi squared times this one over lambda term. That's exactly what I've exactly what I get. So then take take supreme and, and, and take the supreme and, and to, to, to get what we want. It's not it's not a terrible proof, I don't think. And as I say, we can as I mentioned already, we can show that this is the right order and that the CAMS result that we looked at up, up above, um, the one with the horrible constant of eight, is also at the right order, it's the same order as this, uh, because we can prove a lower bound that essentially says that, that, this, that this total variation distance has to look like one over lambda times the sum of the pi squares. Of course, the constant of the lower bound is significantly smaller than the, than the constant that we're getting in the, in the upper bound. Um, Everything that we said before is, is true about constants in Steinfeld method, isn't it? And it doesn't tend to do that well. Okay, it's not the right technique to use if you really care about the constants in your band. Um, but anyway, we can get we, we can get an upper bound of the right order, and in a way that okay, so we we definitely used independence here, but we haven't used it in, in kind of in in so terrible a way that we can get that we can't get around it. So let's, the last thing I want to talk about today is just getting around independence in this proof. And it's essentially not a lot harder. Um, we end up with stuff that's it's a little bit more delicate, of course, these things always are. Um, but it just comes down to, um, comes down to doing something slightly different here, more or less. Okay, so we're just going. We're going to do something slightly different here. We'll start off in exactly the same way. We'll do, we'll do something a little bit different here um, because we're we're we, we were using independence here because I'm essentially I'm conditioning on xi and using the fact that xi and wi are independent to be able to write this down. I'm not sure I emphasised that on the way through, but this this thing here is is, is using is using independence. Otherwise, it's going to be. Otherwise, I'm going to have to have a have write down this expectation conditional on xi being one and um, independence lets me get rid of that condition. So we used independence there, but somehow, and that's a, that's a relatively mild way of using independence. Right? And, and when it comes to writing down these kind of approximation results, it's a relatively mild use of independence um, compared to other techniques. And we can certainly get around it um, Again, using arguments that are due to Chen in the in the seventies. So let's. So it takes a little bit more work to formulate the result in this case, but it's it's not too terrible. So same set, same setup in the, in that I've got a Boolean really random variables um, which are now allowed to be dependent. They each have mean. So x i has mean p i w is the sum, lambda is the, the sum of those p i's, and z is a is a Poisson with the same mean. So one way I can formulate results, and this is a relatively natural way, is to think about well, to do something similar as we did in the Gaussian case. And so for each i, for each xi, I'm going to think about a sort of neighborhood of dependence, which I'm, I'm defining extremely informally, right? because essentially it doesn't matter too much. For the purposes of the statement of the theorem, it doesn't matter how you define them. For applications, it does. But for the statement of the theorem, all I need is that for each x, for each i, I've got some subset of my other x's that, that are associated with that xi in some sense. Okay, so it, I don't I don't need a rigorous definition for, for the statement of the theorem because this will work for any and any gammas that I, I choose. Like this, this bound is true for any gammas that I want. Okay, gamma is just gamma i is just some subset of my x's. That are, that are sort of associated with, with my um, xi. The statement of the theorem is true for any for any x's that I want, but the upper bound is going to be good if I think of my gamma i as being those other x's which are in some sense strongly dependent on xi. So anything which is sort of anything which has some strong dependence on xi should go into gamma i. But we're not assuming that xi is independent of everything outside gamma i, that would be the case in some applications for sure, but we're not assuming that. We're, we're assuming that maybe that they're weakly dependent or in some sense. Um, but if they are, if, if xi is, is 
independent of everything outside gamma, then this second term of my upper bound is going to go away. So that certainly makes life nice in applications, but it's not necessary for the for the um, for the statement of the theorem. But what have I got? So what's this second term? It's essentially telling me about the difference between the expected value of my xi's and the expected value of my xi's conditional on um, everything outside those sets gammas. So just for the sake of notation, this, these sets theta are, are everything else that isn't in my strongly dependent set. And so we can, so, so maybe those things are independent, in which case this conditioning does nothing and that term goes away. Or maybe they're weakly dependent, in which case that term doesn't go away. But in any case, this is telling me about how far away my, um, the expectation of my xi's is unconditionally compared to conditional on everything that it's not strongly dependent on. Okay. And this first term is, well, if I've got some pi's there, fine. This z, these z's are just the sums of the of the x's that xi is strongly dependent on. So somehow I'm, I'm Hopefully this is sort of fairly small, right? If we're close to the independent setting, then maybe this is not too much here, in which case that term looks a lot like my pi squared that I had before. And then there's some sort of extra term that's, that's yeah, that's doing, doing some business to handle the dependence more or less. But I've got lots of things. I mean, this z is just a sum of x's. So what I've got is just lots of things that look like sums of squares of different x's in there. There's nothing more complicated than that going on. You can sort of think of it into, as sort of needing to know about the variance and covariance structure of my x's. This, this z is just a whole bunch of, it's a sum of some xj's. So I've got lots of terms that look like expected value of xi xj. So this upper bound, so the, this upper bound is just sort of, <clears throat> what do I need for that? I need to know about the covariance structure within my x's. That's what that's telling me about. Lots of expectation of xi, xj type terms. Okay, so how do, how do we prove this? We've got a few, we've got five minutes to do this, I think. That's fine. Um, so start, start the same way that we did before. Okay, so that's the same representation that we started with in, in the independent case. And then in the independent case, what did we do? Well, we, we conditioned on that xi and said that Either it was one, in which case that was wi plus one, or it was zero, in which case, it's, in which case, that whole term is zero. That's where we used independence. So now we'll just be a little bit more, a little bit more careful, and we'll add and subtract various things. Um, so we will um, add and subtract terms that look like that, which is what we had before. Right? In, in the independent case, I turned that xif of w into that term. I can't do that now but I can add and subtract that term and I also add and subtract terms that look like similar kinds of things, except now I've replaced that PI by, a, by an XI. So essentially I'm sort of, I'm sort of, so there, there's the XI F of W, there's the XI F of W. I'm sort of splitting it up in a way that I'm, I'm, turn, I'm turning that XI F of W into a PI F of WI plus one, because that's, that's the term I know how to handle from before, but we're doing that via this thing and a couple of remainder terms as well. So essentially I'm sort of, I'm just handling that in a slightly more careful sort of way and it turns out the right kind of way to, to be able to do what we want to do. Because then, all, so all I have to do again is, is bound, use a triangle inequality, bound the absolute values of each of these three expectations in, inside the sums. For the, for the first of those, well, how, what's the difference between f of w plus one and f of wi plus one? Well, okay, I've cheated in my notation slightly, so I, in the sense that it's, it's not quite the same wi that we had before, because now wi is the sum of all of those, um, all, it, it's, Think of it, let's, let's, for the sake of argument, let's think about, about my xi is being dependent on everything inside gamma i and independent of everything outside that. 
okay, just for the sake of, of the proof. It, it, it's not, that, it, we, we don't need that for the proof, but if we can understand that case, we can understand the whole thing, so everything's fine. So in that, in that case, my, my WI is a sum of everything that XI is independent of. Um, so, so that's, which is, which corresponds to the definition we had in the independent case, depending on exactly how you wrote down that definition. Um, but, so what's the, how, how far apart are these things now? Well, the most they can be apart is the number of steps between, um, between these, between W and WI, which is just my XI plus the sum of all the things it's dependent on, times the biggest jumps that F can take for each one of those steps. That's, that tells me, that gives me an upper bound on how far apart those things can be. How far apart can, um, how far apart can these things be? I've got an XI that comes out again. I've got the same kind of argument, number of steps of W. I've got a difference between W and WI. And slightly different bound, but, but similar in, in spirit. How far apart can these things be? Well, um, if we condition on WI, I've got, I've got PI times an, an F minus an X times the same F. I can pull out how big my F can be times the expected value of the difference between PI and that expectation. Let's say in, in the case where, where my X's are independent of everything outside the, the the steps gamma, then that's, that expectation is going to be PI anyway, so this is a term that will disappear. So now I just combine all those to get what we want, um, to get exactly the upper bound that we want. If we, if we were in a case where my x's were all independent, then that gets me back to where I was before. So in that case, in the case where I'm independent, we've already said that, that this second term disappears, my z i's are zero. Then my z i's are my dependent things. I can just, I can just, if, if we're independent, I can just use all those gammas to be empty, the empty set. In which case, z my z is just the sum of the things in my gammas. So that's zero. So that term disappears as well. That's a zero. So all I get is my pi times a, another pi. That gives me my sum of my pi squareds, and that was not one over lambda term. So in the case where we're independent, we haven't lost anything. We, we get back exactly to where we were before. Um, I guess there's one last thing to do today, sorry, it's just, I'll, I'll show you one example just to see how things work. Um, so sort of birthday problem where um, we'll think of it as balls and urns, but it's a sort of typical birthday type, type problem. So we've got little m balls uh, distributed uniformly among, uniformly random among d different boxes. Um, so think about people being allocated to days of the year for the, when they were born. And I'm interested in approximating the number that the number of, pa of pairs of these random variables, the number of pairs, sorry, the number of pairs of these balls that go into the same box. So in that case, I can write I can write this as a as a sum. All I'm going to do is look at the pair. Each term in this sum is going to be a pair of balls, and then um, I'm going to look at the uh, indicators that say that that pair ended up in the same box. Um, so I've got, a, I've got a pair i1, i2. Um, my xi is an indicator that they, that they end up in the same box. So just the sum of those indicators is counting how many of those, those pairs ended up in the same place. So I've got a, it's a relatively big set of things I've got. This, on this, this in, well, I've got m choose two things in there. Um, each pair of balls is in the same box with probability one over D, where D was the number of boxes. So I can work out the means of these things and I can also get a handle on the covariance structure. That's not too, that's not too terrible to work out. I'll leave that for you to think about, but. Um, so, so what am I, how do I want to choose these dependent sets? Well, I want to choose them so that, um, so for each pair, it's going to be dependent on, on other pairs which share which share one of the balls. So for any pairs which either have ball i1 or have ball i2, um, so any any other pairs of balls which have something in common with with, with pair number i is, is going to be in, is going to be sort of in some sense my things that I'm, that I'm dependent on. So I've 
And so that'll be my choice of my, of my gammas. And we're actually independent on, of, of any pairs which don't have a ball in common. So then, like we said, in the case where we're independent of everything outside my gammas, that last term in my upper bound is this. So all I have to worry about is the first term, with terms that look like this. And as I say, once, once I understand the covariance structure, once I understand, um, once I understand the expectation of xi, xj, then that's all I've got to work out here because all these, all these z's are just, these z's are just sums of x's. So I just get lots of sums of x, i, x, j terms. That's where these kind of d squared terms come from. And then I can just play around with my upper bound. I mean, I get this sort of thing, which doesn't look too friendly, but, um, but I can just keep some bounds of the binomial coefficient to make it all look a bit more friendly and show that, okay, if I'm in a sort of regime where, where, um, where lambda, think of maybe lambda is fixed. So, so this is sort of an m squared over d term. So think of that as being something approaching a constant. Then when, if that's true, then when n gets large, this bound goes to zero, for example. The sort of conclusions you can draw from upper bounds like that. So that's, that's all I wanted to say today. Sorry that I've run slightly over what I intended to, but anyway. Um, so next week I want to spend essentially lots of time thinking about size bias couplings for Poisson approximation. I'm going to do something a little bit different than we talked about in the in for sort of zero biasing in that I want to focus on the case where we can take advantage of monotonicity because I think that's nice and that's not something that that works so much in or, or has been so far made to work quite so well in Gaussian approximation settings so I want to think about some slightly different kind of constructions than we've thought about already um, in the sense that I want to take advantage of some monotonicity together with the size biasing. Well, I'll tell you what that means and we'll spend some time doing that next week. To answer questions now if people have questions right now. Then. About yeah, so we can probably uh, stop sharing the screen. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Fraser. Thank you. Thanks for your participation and attendance. Mm -hmm. And that's for today. Thank, thank you yeah. very much. Thank you. See you all next week. Thanks a lot. Yeah. See you next week.